ba, 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 ba. Hey, welcome. It's Sunday morning. Happy Mother's Day. Everybody's got a mother. We are talking today about confession and the office of the keys. Confession and the office of the keys. We have... Uh, we can never really finish talking about baptism. It's something we recall every day, but we've finished with the lessons on baptism, and now we're into the fifth chief part of the small catechism. We are into confession and the office of the keys. This is kind of a, a strange one because we we don't really um, see, we don't uh, realize how often we see the office of the keys, but after we're done with the lesson today, you will realize that you have been um, partaking of, benefiting from the office of the keys for your whole life, and so we we'll look forward to sharing that together. Before we begin, I want to start with a, a story from the Bible. So you have your catechism, you have your Bible, you have your confirmation workbook, so those things are there for you. We're going to go in the Bible to... Uh, Second Samuel, Second Samuel, this is a great confession and forgiveness story. Second Samuel chapter 11. So Samuel comes before kings, comes before chronicles. So Samuel was the one who anointed the kings. That's how I always remember. Second Samuel chapter 11 and uh, in the Old Testament at verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David sat at Jerusalem. He remained. He sat at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the women conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all his servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah will not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why do you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord, the armies, they're all camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my, li my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. So David was trying to get Uriah to go uh, have sex with his wife so that David wouldn't be uh, implicated uh, in the pregnancy. He was trying to make it look like this was Uriah's child so that Uriah wouldn't get upset. So verse 12, then David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord but he still did not go down to his house. Verse 14, In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died because of David's command. Anyways, uh, then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger, when you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then if the king's anger rises and he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Imbibelech? Uh, why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell, the messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us. They came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and, and overthrow it and encourage him. Basically, don't worry about it. Verse 26 of 2 Samuel 11, When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when her mourning was over, 
David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. All right, we got it. just a few more verses. So we, we set up this scene of, of adultery and of murder. Uh, I heard earlier this week, and it's, it's interesting, remembering the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, sixth commandment. Uh, sins of adultery often lead to sins of murder. So sixth commandment issues often lead to fifth commandment issues. We see that here in the, um, the story of David and Bathsheba, David and Uriah. Um, so verse 12 the Lord was, this, this displeased the Lord. And so uh, chapter 12, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to this rich man and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock of the herd to prepare it for the guest who had come to him. But the rich man took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And then he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, because he had no pity. So Nathan tells David a story about this man who's rich, wealthy, has all kinds of cattle and everything, and doesn't want to uh, expend any of them for the sake of a traveler that comes through. But there's this poor guy who, who saved all he could, bought a little lamb, and treated it like a family member. And the rich man took this sheep and had it murdered. So David hears this story. He gets upset. He's like, how could this be? This rich man must pay. And then um, in verse 7, 2 Samuel 12, verse 7, Nathan says to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with them in the sight of the sun. So that's, uh, that is what we, we needed to get through. I wanted you guys to hear this story. Um, oh, no, wait. <laughs> it gets even better. The whole reason we're talking about this. Um, For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. David says to Nathan in verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says to David, The Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. So, so David confesses his sin there. Nathan then, speaking for the Lord, says, The Lord has put your sin away. Um, Psalm, 20, uh, Psalm 51 always, always, always comes to mind with this passage because this is what David wrote um, when uh, he, he realized his sin. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being, you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Familiar words for us. Uh, but David wrote those, um, penned those, that, that song really he wrote when he uh, realized his sin and he was asking God, begging God for forgiveness. So we're talking about confession and absolution today. We're talking about uh, confession and the office of the keys, the fifth chief part of the catechism. And, and we're going to blow through the uh, workbook. So if you haven't gotten that yet, pause it. Now's a good time to go get that. And we're going to uh, get into our, our text today. So what is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. Second, that we receive absolution, that is forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. Um, what sins should we confess? Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second here. So let's go here to the uh, slides and we'll get into the passage here. So um, at the bottom of page 101, 
you see this verse, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession has two parts. Uh, we need to confess our sins and, and he will forgive our sins. Uh, my, my lines are off there, uh, but if, if we confess our sins... Uh, he will forgive our sins. Those are the two parts of confession. So underline the first part of confession. Boy, I should really fix that here. Let me let me do that real quick. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, ba -ba. This is what yours should look like as soon as I uh, move this back up here. Present. Back on the screen. Here we go. Confess our sins and forgive our sins. So those are the two parts. Underline them. Uh, circle that second part, I guess, would be a circle instead of a line underneath the forgive us our sins. So those are the two parts. Keep those in mind. Confession is not uh, just us saying we've done something wrong. Confession is not just us um, saying that uh, we're, we're bad, we're awful, we're evil sinners. But the confession that God gives us, the confession that we talk about in the small catechism, Con continues uh, for for a penitent person, for someone who confesses their sin, it has that absolution, that forgiveness of sins. God does not desire to withhold forgiveness from us. He doesn't desire us to die, but he would rather forgive us and see us live. So that confession has that forgiveness with it as well. All right, so let's go on here and um, take the um, next page, page 102 in your uh, workbook. Questions and answers about, oh wait, before we do that, uh, they, they skipped this in the workbook, but um, in the small catechism, these three places are show, that show up on page uh, 308, uh, 309 of your catechism. Who should we confess to? We should confess to God. All right, so uh, you guys learned this in the Lord's Prayer. I, uh, we, we forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's what we uh, do. We're confessing our sins in that Lord's Prayer. So remember we talked about how we pray the Lord's Prayer. We don't just say the words, but they actually mean things and they draw to mind thoughts for us as we're prayerfully in, in communication with God. So forgive us our trespasses. We're confessing our sins before God. Uh, and, and every single sin that we're, we uh, ever confess, even the sins we don't know, and we say that in our, our church services, uh, we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done, by what we've left undone. Um, We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Um, so what we've done and that we're aware of and what we do that we're not aware of, what we don't do that we're aware of and what we don't do that we're not aware of, all of these things are forms of sin, sins of omission, sins of commission. We talked about those way back at the beginning of our confirmation walk together. Uh, but these sins, we confess them all before God and ask him for his forgiveness. And God is merciful and just and he forgives us our sins. So we confess every single one of our sins to God. So we confess to God. We also confess to our neighbors. And I don't mean uh, Pat Wagner who lives next to me. I don't mean Mark Smith who lives on the other side. I, I, I mean that we confess to anybody in our life, particularly those that we sin against. So we don't walk up to people saying, I had a dirty thought, or I, I've, I've had these mean feelings inside of me, or I... Uh, I stole a, a quarter from my brother, um, unless it's your brother. You don't confess that. You confess it to your neighbors, those who are, are close to you, um, when we sin against them. So we want to make that right by confessing our sins to them, asking for their forgiveness, seeking reconciliation, that is to be brought back together again, not letting that which we've done come in between us. So that's that's a, another person we should confess to. Um, and then uh, me, pastor, pastor love, pastor Climola, pastor in your life, uh, we should confess our sins to our pastors. And this might seem weird and strange, um, and, and maybe it doesn't because you're like, oh yeah, we do that in church, and then the pastor says forgiveness. The That's cool. We call that corporate confession and absolution. That is, as a corporation, as a body of believers together, corporally, we, uh, we make that confession. But there's also something in the church that's very, very powerful called private confession and absolution, or individual uh, confession and absolution. And this is something that I want you to keep in mind. If you are ever troubled greatly by something in your life, uh, if there's ever some sin that's weighing you down, or something that you've done, or even something that's been done to you that you just cannot feel like God can love you uh, because of it, if you're troubled by a sin, if it's burdened, burdened you to the point of, of you can't stop thinking about it, 
come and talk to your pastor. We do private confession absolution so that you can hear God's forgiveness for this particular thing that might be bothering you. And that's a, a great picture in that story we had of David and Nathan. As Nathan said to David, you are the man, convicted him. Um, and then David was convicted and he confessed his sins. And then Nathan said, uh, but your sins are put away. This sin has been put away. Um, yeah, it's still got some consequences, but God's forgiveness is for you. Um, so that's that's powerful. Um, now, this is not a requirement. Individual confession is not a, a mandated thing, but it is a powerful tool that we can use in our, our warfare against the devil. When the devil schemes against us, tries to get us to disbelieve, to doubt, to, to, to wander away from God's word, never let sins become come between you and God. Go speak to your pastor um, and, and hear that forgiveness. All right, so uh, forgiveness has two parts, confession and forgiveness, or we say confession and absolution. That is, you are absolved. You are absolutely forgiven before God, I like to think of it. Um, but but we, ha we have these places we go confess in our life. Now on to our workbook, page 102, some questions about uh, uh, confession and absolution. All right, so how should we regard the absolution spoken by a pastor? You could take a moment to look in your catechism. And read that. Our people are taught that they should highly prize the absolution as being God's voice and pronounced by God's command. So the words that a pastor speaks are God's words. Um, in the forgiveness of sins, the words that I speak are, are God's words. That's really cool. It's kind of... Um, um, kind of a, a, an amazing thing that God gives us that word to speak. We'll talk about that when we get to the office of the keys in just a little bit here. Um, so when the pastor absolves us, that is, he says, I forgive you all your sins. He speaks with Christ's authority and on Christ's behalf. Therefore, we can believe that God himself has completely forgiven our sins. So John 20, verse 23 is where we see the office of the keys. Uh, again, we'll get to that in just a minute. If you forgive the sins of any Jesus is saying to his disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. All right. And then, uh, so, so how should we regard the absolution spoken by a pastor? As if God himself is speaking it. Whoa. All right. Question 31, 331 says, can I be sure that my private confession to the pastor will remain confidential? Absolutely. Um, in the rite of ordination, that is the, uh, the place where a pastor becomes a, a, a able to serve a church and, and is ordained by the church. Uh, in the rite of ordination, the pastor promises before God never to divulge the sins that have been confessed to him. Never means never, for God himself in Christ has removed these sins. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 12, beautiful. For as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. So yes, um, you can be sure that your sins uh, confessed to the pastor will remain confidential. Uh, I, I like it's said that the pastor's ears are like a tomb. What goes into them does not come out because those sins are dead in Christ Jesus and we are alive in Christ and forgiven of our sins. Cool? Cool, I hope so. What is the benefit of individual or private confession and absolution? Um, it's a safe place to speak your sins so that you are no longer carrying them alone. So the absolution is spoken specifically to you when you confess your sins to a pastor. There's no mistaking whose words Jesus is addressing who, who Jesus is speaking when he says your sins are forgiven. Um, there's, there's no doubt in your mind. So when you stand in, in a church um, and you confess your sins, you can be like, well, you know, the pastor's up there saying he forgives, God's forgiven our sins in Jesus, but does he know about that one thing um, or that thing that I, I don't think I can be forgiven for? You get to hear it without a doubt that you are absolutely absolved. You are completely forgiven. Uh, that word of forgiveness um, is there. Um, also, in conversations with the pastor, he, he's not there to be a counselor, um, especially in private co uh, confession absolution situations, but he might help with ways that we can continue to fight against these temptations and these sins that, that af uh, afflict us. So, um, there's a co comment that says, when I urge you to go to confession, I'm doing nothing more than urging you to be a Christian. Um, it's a great thing to, to know that our sins cannot hold us down, and we hear that clearly in confession um, and absolution. So the last question here on this page, how do I prepare for confession? Uh, prepare for confession, uh, use the Ten Commandments. That's why we start off studying those, because they're an important part of our life as a Christian. Consider your life according to the Ten Commandments. Have I um, honored my father and my mother? Have I... Uh, 
all, all of the commandments, we go through them one by one. Have I put other things before God in my life? Have I misused God's name? Have I taken God's word seriously in my life? Have I dishonored my parents? Have I neglected somebody's life and health? Have I uh, looked at someone lustfully? Um, have I stolen or taken or abused something that doesn't belong to me? Have I spoken poorly of somebody else? Have I not been content with what God has given me in this world? And so we go through all the commandments. And we realize that each of those questions can probably bring something to mind for each of us um, that that will is worthy of confession. And sometimes are more troubling than others. So we prepare that way. We consider who we are, what we're supposed to be doing in the world, and ask if we're, we're doing it the right way. My color's going off here, but that's all right. Let's go back to the slides here for the next one. Um, so the Office of the Keys. The Office of the Keys is, is the place where uh, Jesus has given us uh, the power to forgive sins. This is pretty cool. So um, let me read this for you. The office of the keys is that special authority with which Christ has given his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but, with, but to withhold forgiveness from unrepentant sinners um, as long as they do not repent. So it shows up three places in the, uh, in the Bible. Matthew 16, verse 19. Matthew 18, verse 18. John 20, verse 22 through 23. We see the... Uh, uh, confession and absolution spoken of there. And and in those places, real quickly, we see almost the same things. Matthew 18, 18 says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So that's that's um, an example of the binding and the loosing. And so what is a binding? Uh, that's when you lock something up. When you loose something, that's when you unlock something. All right. So that's the uh, the office of the keys in a nutshell that Jesus has given to us. Uh, spoke to his disciples, but it's but it's really um, to for for all Christians, for all believers, we all hold this authority. And this is where the office of the keys really becomes a an interesting thing. It's a good picture for us of the church. Because um, we don't all go walking around saying, hey, your, all your sins are forgiven. Or you want to make private confession to me? I'll forgive your sins. Because uh, God's given me the power and the authority to do that. Um, so we have the uh, office of the keys given to the church. But then the church passes those keys, puts those keys in the hand of somebody who's, who's trained and whose job it is to do the locking and the unlocking of the sins. All right. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but it's good. So... Who is to be forgiven and who is not to be forgiven? All right, so we, I want to ask both of those questions because it's easy for us to, to answer that first one. We, we often think, well, everybody's to be forgiven, right? We're, we're all supposed to, um, God wants to forgive everybody their sins, correct? Um, that is absolutely correct. So all those who repent and ask for forgiveness of their sins are to be absolved. Amen. Thanks be to God. That's awesome. Here's this hairy part, though, who is not to be forgiven. Um, well, this is those who do not repent and believe in Jesus Christ. They're not to be forgiven as long as they continue in their impenitent ways. So someone who says, I don't think that's a sin, um, even though they're, they're dishonoring their parents, or I don't think that's a sin, even if they're um, having sexual relations outside of marriage, or I don't think that's a sin, even if they're a, a licentious bank robber, or, a, or any kind of bank robber, really. Um, so those... If they say, well, this isn't bad, it's my right, I get to do this, it's my decision, you can't tell me what's right and what's wrong, um, that's that's a place where forgiveness is not to be given. Um, and so it's it's a serious situation when somebody is stuck in sin and they want they don't want to repent of their sin. Um, and, and so this, this comes up um, in in our, our lives at times, and I, and I pray that the Lord would deliver us from such obstinacy, from such evils, that we would continue to uh, be his children and and know his ways and, and desire to walk in them as the Holy Spirit calls us. I'm going to breathe for a second here. Sip of coffee. I'm, uh, I'm all Michiganed out today. I hope you don't mind. It's M for Mother's Day. All right. So the uh, symbol of the keys is used um, in confession and absolution because of that binding and that loosing. That's why we call it the office of the keys. All right, bottom of page 103, it talks about church discipline and excommunication. Um, those who will not listen or repent of their sin and continue to live in opposition to God's word may be excommunicated by the church. They may no longer be part of the fellowship in the Christian church or receive the Lord's Supper. So those who are impenitent um, and continue to live in opposition to God's word, 
um, are, are excommunicated by the church, can be excommunicated by the church. Now, this is something we actually have uh, the ability to excommunicate. And, um, and the, the way our, our churches are set up today, where you can pass 10 churches to get to uh, your, your church on Sunday morning uh, when you go to church or when you can. Um, churches are, are a dime a dozen. That's maybe not the best way to talk about it, but we have lots of options. So oftentimes when people get into situations where they might be excommunicated, they just leave. They just go somewhere else and they, don't, they go to a church that will allow them to continue living the way they want to live um, God have mercy on us, help us to, to live according to his words. But in the situation where someone says, you know what, I am a member of this church and I believe what I'm doing is is okay, and the church has gone through the process and said, no, really what you're doing is a sin and we, 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 need you, we want you to stop this. We want you to, to live according to God's way. Um, they say, no, 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 I'm right, you're wrong. Um, so the church has this right of excommunication. Um, John 20, verse 23, this is uh, from the uh, pastor's agenda. Beloved in the Lord, Christ our Lord says in the gospel according to St. John, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain them, they are retained. So here would be the retaining of sins. And this isn't done so that we can be like, well, you've messed up and now your sins are retained forever. Um, down at the bottom here, before I read the, the meat of this or some of it, may God Almighty mercifully grant them grace to confess their sins so that they might receive the Lord's forgiveness and be restored to communion within God's with God in his church. So this, this right of excommunication is something that's done in the hopes that someone will see the errors of their ways and will not continue to, to transgress God's word or think that they are okay without Jesus' forgiveness um, in, in whatever the situation may be. So um, it, it talks in this uh, passage here about how this would lead up. So, so this is what would be said if, if an excommunication were to take place. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I must make known to you that our fellow member, Joe Blow, has by continued impenitence despised his baptism. He was under church discipline and although repeatedly admonished from the word of God, refused to repent. Following the direction of our Lord in the gospel according to St. Matthew, I and other members of this congregation have pleaded repeatedly with him to receive Christ's forgiveness, one for him on the cross, but to no avail. Finally, Joe Blow refi refuses to also hear the church. So this is talking about Matthew chapter 18, where if we see somebody in sin, we're to go to him and tell them their sin privately, personally, directly. He's, hey, I see that you're doing this, Joe, and, and you need to stop. Um, this isn't good for you. And Joe's like, nah, it's no big deal. Leave me alone. And then maybe you take somebody with you who's who's aware of the situation and who knows Joe and says, hey, Joe, we're here together and, and we want you. And, and so this process um, finally culminates going to the church uh, and the church saying, nope, this is this is wrong, Joe. You're not supposed to be doing this. And Joe's like, D leave me alone. And, and that, that's where excommunication comes in. So in order to show the seriousness of his or her impenitence as a last effort to win them back to our Lord, I announce that they are now excommunicated from the Holy Christian Church until they repent. They may not come to this or any Christian altar for the Lord's Supper. They're not permitted to serve as a sponsor at baptism nor engage in any rights or privileges of the church except to hear the preaching of God's word. So this doesn't say they can't come to church. It just says they can't have the Lord's Supper and they can't be sponsors at baptism um, and, and anything except for hearing the word of God. And, and that's powerful. The word of God is powerful. And this shows us again, like I said, that this is the desire that they would come to receive the Lord's forgiveness and, and um, give up their sinful ways. So I, I, I show that because it's, it's, it's out there. It really exists. But like I said at the beginning, this I've never done this. And I would be surprised if I ever had to do it. Lord, have mercy. I hope I never have to. But the um, um, transit transitory nature of our world today means that people can just leave and they can find a place that will allow them to do whatever they want to do. Anyways, tangent there. But anyway, this is um, afterwards. So this is called the, uh, the I forget, I didn't have the title here, but after excommunication, it's not like a last word that person hears, uh, but this right here is the right of uh, uh, forgiveness, uh, absolution. I should have looked up what it's called. Um, but, but basically right here, based on the scripture, uh, because Joe Blow, having been under excommunication for a time, has now, by the grace of God, come to repentance and has received the forgiveness of sins in the holy absolution, I joyfully announce that their excommunication is removed and that they are restored to the holy Christian church. They may once again share in the Lord's Supper with us, serve as sponsors at baptism, and engage in all the rights and privileges of the church. So this is uh, the... Uh, con uh, 
Office of the Keys, what it looks like on a on a big level, on, on a very small level, the pastor is responsible for, for making sure that people are ready to receive the Lord's Supper, which excommunication is a very big picture of that, saying, well, this person's not in a place to receive the Lord's Supper because they're living uh, contrary to God's word and, and unwilling to repent. On a smaller level, pastors do, uh, Office of the Keys shows up as we're uh, uh, teaching and making sure and instructing and making sure that, that people are well prepared to receive the Lord's Supper as we are doing right now, and we'll get into that in just a little bit, and that they understand the gifts of baptism and that they take care of the, the gift of baptism that's given to them. Bottom of page 103, um, what is the purpose of excommunication? It's to help people get to forgiveness, help people repent of their sin. Um, what happens if the person repents? They are uh, forgiven. Thanks be to God. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I, I think this is a really cool picture um, of the way the church works and, and a way that I hope you guys will own your church membership as you go through confirmation. That I, I, I know I talked about people will just leave if they feel like they're being told that what they're doing is wrong. They'll go find some place where it's right. But as you're joining this church, you're joining up front to say that I believe what this church believes, that if I'm in error, I'm going to believe this church's corrections and listen to their instructions and their teachings. They're, they're going to be what I want to live in so that even if the church tells me I'm wrong, I'm going to say, thank you. I, I hope that I can continue to hear God's word in a, in a right way. Anyways, I don't know if you guys heard, we, we called a, uh, another pastor, so we got another pastor coming, and this uh, plays in very well to what's going on with uh, this last page of our, our lesson for today. Um, page 104, uh, so the pastoral office and service in the church, I kind of hinted at this earlier, that we all have the ability to forgive sins, even with Jesus' authority, uh, but a pastor is somebody who's very specifically given to do it in a way. So um, looking at God's word at the top there, uh, top of 104, I don't have this in the uh, slide for you. But Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then uh, Jesus breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So Matthew 28, John 20, um, when Jesus says, Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, he's teaching them to observe the forgiveness of sins. He's, teaching them to, uh, he's talking about teaching them to observe baptism. He's also teaching them to observe the, the Lord's Supper, which we'll talk about in the next couple of weeks. Um, so, so these things were, uh, God has in Christ Jesus given uh, the church the authority to oversee these things. And so, so we have these roles um, and responsibilities in the body of Christ. And, and the pastor is the one that's uh, kind of selected by God, called by God, but also called by the congregation to be the forgiveness man, to be the sacraments man, to be the preaching man in this place. So um, roles and vocations in the body of Christ, students, teachers, mothers, daughters, fun, fathers, sons, teachers, engineers, doctors, babysitters, friends, all of these things are, are things that everybody in the body of Christ can do. Um, even within that, you can be a pastor, but that maybe gets a little confusing as we see this diagram here. So we all have different functions in the body of Christ. We all share the gospel. We all have responsibilities as the body of Christ. In this spot right here, we see that we are all to forgive. We are all to encourage. We are all to pray and serve. And then down at the bottom, the pastor is the one that the congregation selected to exercise the office of the keys publicly, forgiving and retaining sins, publicly preaching and publicly administering and, and administering the sacraments. So so this is, this is a helpful thing, as, as, especially as we're getting another pastor here. He's going to be ordained in a couple months, and, and he'll be among us. He'll be doing the pastory things alongside Pastor Love and myself. Trinity has chosen to say this, this guy coming. Um, he's been rightly trained, and, and he's, been, uh, he's, been, he's prepared himself for this ministry, and that, now he's going to do it among us, and he's going to help us in our life of, of faith. Uh, by wielding and, and utilizing those office of the keys uh, to protect us and to guide us and to keep us. And so I hope that's a, a good introduction for you, at least for the confession, absolution, the office of the keys, fifth chief part of the small catechism. Um, we are going to wrap here with, uh, not like wrap, but 
we're going to um, finish it up. And um, don't forget that your, uh, your um, sermon notes, those are, are things you can do. Uh, please be doing those. Uh, memory work, please be working on that, memorizing those parts according to uh, the, the schedule we had at the beginning of the year. If you need another copy of that, we are off the schedule by about a month, but we have about three weeks left of class, and we're going to um, keep going here. And we'll be done by the almost end of May. And then, um, so confirmation.trinitylutheran.org, which might be where you're watching this right now. Every week before you watch this video, you want to do the questions preparing you for the, the, the video ahead. Uh, you get a video from Pastor Jerkin, and then you can uh, answer some questions, uh, get some thoughts flowing in your head. Then you can watch me ramble about these things and, and fill out your workbook as you go along. Um, please be in prayer. Please be in your catechism. Please be in your Bible, not because you have to, but because you get to. It's a really cool tool. It's a really cool gift, and I, I just pray uh, God is uh, continuing to uh, bless you and keep you in these days of, of distancing, and I, I look forward to seeing you guys uh, back in person soon. God be with you.